names like Sovereign Resources, which is a rutile and graphite and rare earth play, uh, attracts me. Centaurus is another example. Uh, platinum and palladium and nickel play, all out of favor. Uh, in Brazil, it attracts me. Uh, I don't know who is going to take over next gen and fission, but there's a huge opportunity in the western part of the basin. Uh, I've uh, begun to sell uh, my Australian juniors, not because they've done a poor job, they've done a great job. I've just begun to sell them because they went from being very, very cheap to reasonably priced. What there isn't money available for, mercifully, uh, right now, are the high GNA micro cap lifestyle stories. I am attracted to a, a geological belt called the Tethian Metallogenic Belt. With regards to Mexico, I think the situation is deteriorating. I think Greenland is a really interesting place to live geologically. All right, Rick, um, I'm going to go ahead and assume that people have listened to at least one of the last 1,600 interviews that you and I have done over the last couple of years. So I'm going to skip the intro here because it's finally 2024. It's the year of the dragon, but I don't know how to invest in dragons. So I'm looking into investing in something else. And uh, I know you don't like con constraining yourself to short-term predictions, but uh, what subset of the commodity market or non-commodity market are you looking to sort of start or, or increase your position in in 2024? I'm interested in the disparity between the performance of uh, the gold price itself as a commodity mm -hmm. uh, and the prices of the underlying gold equities. Uh, given that I think that gold will do well anyway, uh, and given the fact that gold has rewarded me very well, uh, albeit punished me too, uh, but very well for two or three years at a time <laughs> over many decades, uh, I'm uh, attracted in, in the context of the question that you asked me uh, about a range of gold equities. I'm attracted to the gold equities market, both in the beta sense, which is to say buying what I consider to be the highest quality companies, because I think that those companies probably will outperform the general market, at least those portions of the general market that I'm comfortable with. But I'm also uh, accepting a very risk on posture uh, by trying to invest primarily in private placements uh, in earlier stage companies where either they have an absolutely superb uh, area play concept, very much like the success that Kennerland enjoyed uh, a couple of years ago, or where they have what I consider to be a really good uh, discovery drill hole and some follow-up holes where the market uh, hasn't played particular attention. So I'm really attracted uh, to the gold equity space uh, precisely because it hasn't performed. One of the things I'm certain when I talk about gold uh, and more when I talk about silver is that there will be comments uh, in the sections underneath this video that say, why on earth would he be advocating gold? It hasn't performed. That's precisely why I'm advocating it. Uh, I remember very much the comments that accompanied our discussions about uranium two and a half years ago. Uranium is dead. Why would I buy uranium? Well, certainly the last 18 months has answered that question. And I suspect that 2024 or 2025 will answer the question around the gold equities too. And I suspect that the answer will be very much the same. So I'm attracted to that. It's a uh, challenge. As I say, both as a beta investor, which is to say in the high quality names, and as an alpha investor in the very, very, very high quality, but more speculative names. Uh, I'm, I think, going to pay particular attention, and I'm not sure that your, your, list, your listeners should do this, but I'm going to pay particular attention uh, to the sub $10 million market cap mm -hmm. Canadian players where the probability is failure. That is to say where more often than not, I'll lose money on the trade, but where the reward for being right is likely 10 to one or 15 to one. Uh, we are in a, we are in a circumstance where the hyper juniors have underperformed the broad market so spectacularly and where the liquidity is gone, that I'm seeing companies that used to have $150 million market caps that have very good exploration targets and proof of concept by way of discovery holes with market caps at 6 or $7 million Canadian. 
uh, doing save the company financings right now with full long-term warrants. Uh, and that circumstance where you combine uh, an improbable outcome, which discourages people with a lack of liquidity, which discourages people, <laughs> hmm. but a around uh, a play that with admittedly improbable success yields uh, a 10 bagger or a 15 bagger or a 20 bagger with a full warrant. And note that with a full warrant, a 10 bagger becomes a 15 or 16 bagger. <laughs> Um, I can't help myself. I I'm going to do that this year because the stuff is so out of favor compared to 2019 and 2020 mm. that I believe that an intelligently constructed portfolio of 12 to 15 of these things probably generates combined internal rates of return north of 50%, which I'm looking forward to. Mm. Well, you do have a special relationship with warrants, um, as we know, so that's kind of uh, expected there. No, well, well, but I suppose that's also the challenge, right? Because you sort of have the the larger miners that are challenged because of inflation, labor shortages, and growing red tape and geopolitical issues and all that. And then at the same time, you have the juniors that um, are challenged because the stock prices are low, which normally doesn't matter in a in a normal uh, you know in a normal market, but in this market it matters because that's how they finance themselves. So how do you how do you deal with that uh, conundrum? Well, what I have found is that there is a group of investors like myself, most of whom are known to me, uh, and to the extent that we find something with a ten million dollar market cap that deserves being financed purely from a geological basis that it can get finance. Uh, you know, this group of investors, that none of, for, none of it, it, it's none of our first rodeos. <laughs> and when we describe opportunities to each other, we begin with the preface. Uh, it is more likely than not that you lose money on this print. Uh, but if you make money, uh, it's very likely to be a 10x or maybe a 20x. And in those circumstances where you can, let's say there's a company with a, I don't know, $8 million market cap. Um, let's say that you can test the thesis with a million and a half or 2 million bucks. And let's say it's going to cost the company a million bucks to stay alive. You need to raise $3 million. Uh, there, and, I, and I'm talking Canadian dollars, right? So in terms of US dollars, uh, it, it becomes less onerous. The, the truth is for uh, outcomes that are substantiated by facts in the ground, uh, there's still money available for that. What there isn't money available for, mercifully, uh, right now, are the high GNA micro cap lifestyle stories. The companies that consistently spend 50 or 60 percent of the money raised on general administrative expense uh, and don't have uh, a field program that could generate 10 to 1 or 15 to 1 or 20 to 1. People going around saying if the market recovers, this stock will double. A double, uh, given the probability of loss, isn't a high enough internal rate of return. Uh, you need to be playing the game for 10 baggers or 15 baggers if you're going to play in the sub $10 million space. And if you are going to play in a size where the lack of liquidity means that if you mis make a mistake, you're going to make a serious mistake because you can't sell your stock, you have to have a warrant to compensate you for the risk. In other words, if you're going to be right, you have to be really, really, really right. Hmm. We're back and talking about warrants. I like that because uh, I, I got my first warrant in 2023 and it's kind of exciting to see where it goes. And it's almost in the money already. So I feel like I might finally make some money in 2024. Uh, gold's not the only metal in that situation, though, where the metal has gone up, the stocks have not followed. So why specifically gold? Um, I, in my experience, Antonio, and past doesn't have to be prologue, by the way. In my experience, in precious metals, gold establishes the market. Gold is first. Silver moves further and faster. Uh, and silver is, in fact, more hated than gold. So I'll be looking forward to making silver allocations, precisely because it's disappointed so many of the faithful, uh, precisely because it's so deeply out of favor, precisely because it has no momentum, precisely because there's all hate. 
there's less there's less competition in that market. Uh, people want to be contrarian when it's popular, <laughs> and that's a hell of a chore, you know. So I like the gold and silver market, but you know the truth is that I like any company that has a deposit that could be, from my point of view, tier one. I define tier one as in excess of uh, ten billion dollars in in situ recoverable reserves and resources that could be in the best quartile worldwide in terms of return on capital employed. Certainly. Uh, 25% plus, uh, and also in the best uh, cost quartile uh, in terms of AISC worldwide. So names like Sovereign Resources, which is a rutile and graphite and rare earths play. Uh, in Malawi, uh, a country that most people can't spell or pronounce, uh, attracts me. Hmm. Uh Centaurus is another example. Uh, platinum and palladium and nickel play all out of favor. Uh, in Brazil, it attracts me. I'm, in a sense, less commodity centric when I see a deposit that has the chance to be uh, a critically important deposit that has to be bought by a major. You'll note from that answer, and we've discussed in past interviews, the fact that I'm much more accepting of political risk or, or perceived political risk than many of the people that you have on your show. Uh, I've been treated poorly uh, in almost every country on the planet, uh, and I don't expect to be treated particularly well in countries that other people believe to be riskless. So I go where the deposits are. Uh, you'll note from earlier discussions as an example that I've been a 40-year beneficiary of the efforts of the Lundin family. And they've taken me to Mongolia and Papua New Guinea and Sudan and Syria uh, and Ethiopia. <clears throat> uh, many, many, many countries that uh, speculators either couldn't spell uh, or wouldn't invest in, but with great results. And so I'm very willing personally to take what's perceived to be political risk in exchange for really, really lowering my technical risk. Mm. I, I realize that's not a that's not a popular thesis with people, which is probably one of the reasons why it's worked for me. Looking at where that political risk right now is, um, one of the main things that pops to mind is the Sahel Belt, which is where yes. most of the world's gold comes from. So, what are you what are you are you exposed to that? Yeah, I'm particularly attracted to what was laughingly called MENA, Middle East and North Africa. Uh, I am attracted to a, a geological belt called the Tethian Metallogenic Belt, which depends on, depending on your interpretation of the geology, uh, begins in the Ukraine uh, or, uh, you know, Serbia, extends through Turkey curves back through all those countries where the name ends in Stan and ends up in Mongolia. Uh, I believe it's probably the best underexplored metallogenic belt, particularly for copper and gold porphyries on the planet. Uh, I think that those countries, particularly in Central Asia, have the same potential for copper deposits today that Chile and Papua New Guinea had in the 1960s and 70s. And so I'm certainly playing that game as aggressively as I can. I also note the Nubian or the Arabian shield uh, as a greenstone belt uh, being eagerly now explored on the Saudi side, uh, among others by my friend Robert Friedland, in conjunction with the government of Saudi Arabia, but also by a broad range of other people, and now increasingly being exploited or explored, pardon me, on the Egyptian side. And it's worthy to note that that uh, belt uh, extends down through Somalia, <laughs> tough place, <laughs> Eritrea, you know, tough place. Uh, but I'm uh, attracted to that sort of stuff. And I'm attracted, as you suggest, to the whole Sahel. Mm -hmm. uh, the Sahel is a particularly unstable uh, area. The recent coups uh, in Niger, uh, Mali and Burkina Faso come to mind. But the simple fact that those regions have decided to disengage with the French 
doesn't necessarily make them uh, riskier. Mm. I've paid real attention to the political pronouncements, but also the public actions of the new governments uh, in Mali and Burkina Faso. And the success that companies like B2 have had in those companies, in those countries, pardon me, despite regime change. And to the extent that I'm offered up opportunity in those places, I'm certainly going to take it. Mm. So, so what about, uh, well, I'll get specific here because I don't know how to dance around it, but something like Sun Peak Metals, which is in Ethiopia, an active war zone that's not covered as well in the broad media, but but it, it's what it is. It's a war zone. Mm -hmm. How do you deal with something like that? I don't have a position, by the way, but it's something of interest. Yeah, it's something I'll look at. The truth is that uh, I made, by my standards, uh, you know, I'm no Rockefeller, but by my standards, I made a lot of money in the Congo in 95, 96, and 97. There was a war there that killed 2 million people. Uh, it was a hard place to make money, a hard time to make money. But the simple fact that it was a hard time and a hard place to make money disguised for many investors the incredible uh, metallogenic potential of Southern Congo. Uh, and I think that uh, Ethiopia, Eritrea, Somalia, Sudan in particular, uh, are all places where provided the right opportunity at the right price, I'll play. Hmm. Now, you know, this is not riskless, uh, as you know, uh, Antonio, Russia treated me very well for 22 years until it didn't. <laughs> and when it stopped treating me well, it treated it, it treated me poorly <laughs> in what was for me a fairly substantial measure. Uh, I, many years ago, uh, invested in grassroots exploration in Afghanistan and lost uh, 100% of the capital employed. Uh, so this isn't a, a strategy for the faint of heart, and it isn't a strategy for somebody who doesn't have the financial means to be exposed to total loss. I'm 70 years of age. I've been investing and speculating in natural resources since age 20, so for 50 years. Mercifully, I've been smart, I've worked hard, and I've been very lucky. Uh, and I do have room in my account for situations where the probability of some loss, there is a possibility of total loss, but there's also a possibility for extraordinary returns of the type that I earned in Congo uh, when that country was embroiled in a total war. You, It's interesting you said that Russia treated you as in past tense of treat poorly. Are you completely out of Russia? No. Uh, uh, I have not attempted to redomicile my shares into Russia, which I think might put me in violation of U.S. sanctions. Yeah. Uh, I've chosen not to do that. So my Russian investments are in limbo. Uh, I have chosen for U.S. tax purposes to write them off completely. Hmm. Uh, and given the current state of affairs between Russia and the United States, and given the fact that I couldn't sell those shares if I wanted to without redomiciling them into Russia, I believe that that's the correct accounting and tax treatment. Uh, if, uh, and I hope it does for many reasons, peace ultimately prevails, perhaps I'll be able to recapture uh, some of the money that I lost recently in Russia. I need to say that if you look back over now almost 30 years of, in Rus uh, of investing in Russia, but what I lost was the house's money. <laughs> I, I was so far ahead uh, in terms of accrued dividends and captured capital gains that what I lost was part of my gain. I had enough invested in Russia for a long enough period of time uh, that the loss of gain uh, still, from my point of view, added up to a painful amount of money. But if the truth were told on a net present value basis, Russia treated me well overall. Hmm. I think that many people who were sort of first movers after the Soviet Union fell apart, including the commodity traders, made a, a, a an obscene amount of money out of whatever came after that. Um, but a lot of money that was not necessarily covered in media or in popular books or whatever was also made from from the collateral damage that was done by the falling apart of the Soviet Union. And that's also making me think about the collateral damage that's being done to neighboring countries, to Russia. 
uh, your Kazakhstan or even or you know Eastern Europe, where like there's Polish coal miners, for example, that are suffering um, in the public's eyes, but not necessarily suffering in terms of earnings. So is that something you also pay attention to, sort of the peripheral collateral damage of war zones? I don't. Uh, I'm not a political analyst. Uh, I pay attention to investments in those countries uh, pretty much from a geology and engineering viewpoint. Mm. Uh, I, I just take take the point of view uh, that the political risk in the countries you describe is bad, but the political risk in the countries that are described as good is usually bad too. <laughs> uh, you know, people say, you know, this could happen in those countries, that could happen in those countries. Uh, they don't talk about the fact that, as, a, as an example, the Resolution Copper Deposit in Arizona was discovered almost 30 years ago. A billion ton deposit of one and a half percent copper, three times the mine grade worldwide. It probably won't be permitted for another 10 years. Uh, so what do you say to a country that delays the permitting of a project by 20 years on a net present value basis? The money that should have accrued to the shareholders two decades ago is gone on a net present value basis. And people say Arizona is safe. I need to say uh, safe in terms of narrative or safe in terms of arithmetic because the arithmetic is challenged. Hmm. Especially for the companies that have to raise money to keep themselves alive while going sure. through that process. Uh, or even the worst counterpart to that, which is companies who specifically look for projects that have a lot of red tape around them so that red tape around them so that they can live a good lifestyle around them and be like, oh, we're doing work on the papers. That's something I've also come across in 2023. Um, what about Australia in this case? I don't typically ask about Australian natural resource plays because it feels distant for me. Um, I don't know why, well, and I suppose I shouldn't follow my feelings, but how do you look at Australia? Australia has treated me very well. Uh, I need to say that the Australian market has performed substantially better than the Canadian market. I think there's reasons for that. I think that there is a history in the Australian financial services community to understand that the correct value chain is rocks to money rather than rocks to stocks and stocks to money. The Canadian dealers I spent, I think spent too much time looking for a 25 cent deal that they could jitney to 55 or 75 cents. Well, the Australian financial services committee over the last community over the last 15 years has been more inclined to finance real exploration, but Australia is no longer cheap compared to Canada. Uh, certainly, there are advantages that Australia has, as an example, simply that the weather is better <laughs> in terms of uh, ex exploration and production. But Australia has treated me very well. And there is a subset of Australian companies, which is to say the Australian juniors that are exploring in Africa, where they seem to do a better job than their Canadian counterparts. Hmm. I'm not sure why that is. Perhaps they're used to hot weather. I don't know what it is. But I do note that the exploration results that I've obtained from Australian juniors operating in Africa have been better than the exploration results that I've gotten from their Canadian counterparts, except for where those Canadian counterparts are run by guys named Lundin or Friedland. Well, this also uh, regulation disclosure is also different in Australia. I generally find it um, b better, I suppose. I, I don't know about regulation. I just think that the... Uh, Australian financial services community has been a bit more discerning than their Canadian counterparts. Hmm. Uh, and I may be wrong. It may be that I just got lucky, uh, but I did get lucky and Australia has treated me very, very well, not just in terms of the export of Australian expertise and technology, uh, but also in, in terms of the application of the same attributes in Australia itself has treated me very well. And I, intend to stay as long as the opportunity is there. My only comment is that uh, where 10 years ago, the uh, Australian market was undervalued compared to the Canadian market for the same range of assets. Uh, today, the Australian market is probably marginally more expensive than the Canadian market. Hmm. Uh, I also suspect that maybe the availability of skilled labor is uh, 
is also a thing uh, because the graduates, like if you look at the graduate numbers of, um, of Australian universities versus Canadian universities and which part is focused around mineral exploration, there's a clear difference there. I, I think that's true. Uh, natural extractive activities are still a more important part of the Australian economy hmm. than they are the Canadian economy. And the what you say is very true. The uh, industry support for education in Australia is more advanced. The number of young people still pursuing careers uh, and education in earth science uh, tilts in Australia's favor. Uh, and I think that that'll make a difference over the next 10 years. Mm. Gee, are you holding anything Australian right now or just because of the value, not so much? No, I, I hold a lot of Australian names. Mm. Um and I expect to continue where I'm probably erring uh, towards the Canadians is in the sub $10 million market space. Mm. The Canadian, the pardon me, the Australians seem to believe that having to issue a warrant to a speculator like me impugns their masculinity. Uh, and I wouldn't want to do that, of course. No, it's absolutely true. It's, it's, it's very funny that you'd say that, you know, at C financings last year, uh, from Aussie companies, no warrants whatsoever. And then sometimes I'd see uh, a charity flow through financing with a full warrant, and it's even a five-year warrant or something like that from Canada. So right. good point. Uh, would, would that mean, though, that with I'm um, going back to the availability of skilled labor in Australia, would it mean that you're focusing uh, on on stuff like iron ore, coal, natural gas in Australia, because that those are the biggest exports that they, that, that, that they have? Well, iron ore, you've really only got three ways to play it. Uh, you've got BHP, Rio, and Fortescue. Hmm. Uh, and while those names are important to iron ore, uh, with the exception of Fortescue, those are really uh, diversified companies. So it's difficult, with the exception of Fortescue, to get a, pull, a, a pure play, uh, iron play in Australia. There's also not much information to, uh, uh, asymmetry, hmm. uh, which is something I like. The coal business is very different. Uh, Australians, like everybody else, hate the coal business, uh, yeah. which means that uh, Aussie coal companies are pretty cheap <laughs> and the Aussies are pretty good at mining coal. So yeah. that does attract me. Uh, I'm, uh, I was uh, two and a half or three years ago particularly attracted to the Australian uranium companies because there was no competition in Australia for those uranium equities. The, the Australians have a three mines policy. They're anti-nuclear despite the fact that their uranium industry is absolutely world-class in every sense, hmm. and they were particularly cheap. Uh, notice I said were. <laughs> uh, I've uh, begun to sell uh, my Australian juniors, not because they've done a poor job. They've done a great job. I've just begun to sell them because they went from being very, very cheap to reasonably priced. Uh, and when you have the opportunity to monetize what I call the hate arbitrage, uh, a market that's gone from being absolutely despised to one that's being tolerated to even in favor. The easiest money in the sector has been made, and I've certainly taken it upon myself to harvest the gains, uh, although not selling total positions, but harvest the gains that I enjoyed in the Australian junior uranium space. Mm. Someone goes and look at looks at the comment section right now. They think you're a criminal for selling anything uranium related. But as, as <laughs> some of my best friends have told me, nobody went broke taking a profit. So good good job on taking a profit. You know, um, they thought I was a, they thought I was a criminal when I was advocating buying uranium stocks too. They thought I was talking my book. So yeah. I don't, uh, you know, I actually look at the comment section slavishly to determine what generates the most hate, so that I can continue with that activity. Hmm. Well, I'll tell you what, warrants uh, are not particularly loved by retail investors because somehow they don't learn how to use them. Uh, but again, I'm, I'm starting to get a grasp on it and then I uh, hope it's going to treat me well. And, and I agree with you on the Aussie uranium, um, on the Aussie uranium sector specifically. But what they don't have, though, is is an Athabasca Basin. They have some stuff that are close to it, but n not nearly as close in grade. So do you think that some of the big boys, like your BHP, Rio, and whoever – although maybe the large diversified miners are going to start coming, let's call it coming back into the Athabasca Basin because they were there before. So do you think they're going to start coming into uranium deposits this time around? 
the Auss- the the big companies you mean yeah almost almost certainly if they're allowed uh, mm-hmm. i don't know who is going to take over next gen and fission but there's a huge opportunity in the western part of the basin uh, those two deposits the next gen deposit clearly the best deposit but the fission deposit also a very good uh, deposit uh that'll be a very large capital expenditure and those deposits should be built together so that you don't duplicate uh infrastructure expenditures that will require a very large company i don't think that the canadian government will allow china general nuclear to be that company so then the range of companies is well almost certainly cameco would be in the offing um Perhaps tech uh, with uh, the money from the coal spinoff could be in the offing. But much more likely uh, probably would be a BHP or a Rio or a Glencore, uh, a supranational that wanted to establish a position in uranium around a tier one deposit. Hmm. And I I, I think uh, that that is an opening. The Canadian juniors have done a reasonably good job uh, staking and conceptualizing new play types in the Athabasca Basin. Uh, Where the Australians, I think, have been more astute explorers uh, has been in Africa. Hmm. Uh, The Australians, my old friend Paladin, uh, as an example, but others too, uh, have been uh, active throughout Africa in uranium exploration. I think they've been quicker movers than the Canadians, and I think they've been smarter too. Uh, and that's probably more what I was talking about. I did have a, a nice position. Uh, now I have a much smaller position in one Australian-based junior boss, uh, which was active in Australia per se, uh, a deposit that I remembered well from the last bull market in uranium and, and was available simply too cheaply uh, in 2021. It's interesting you mentioned Cameco when you talked about uh, next gen and fission, though, because rough calculations tell me that in order to buy next gen and fission, then build the two deposits, it's going to take about seven to eight billion Canadian dollars. That's about half of Cameco's market cap. You want a nice premium on that so the shareholders are going to vote for it. You're already coming close to Cameco's total market cap, and it seems like they don't necessarily want to. I mean, they're they're vertically diversifying, but not necessarily. Um, horizontally so i mean did did you see that as a as a reasonable probability for cameco to be the one who who opens up the western athabasca basin uh i i think it's a i think it's a substantial step for them i think if the canadian government indicates that needs to be a canadian player that cameco would be able to raise the money to do it Hmm. uh and the cameco management team has shown with the recent acquisition of the Westinghouse assets, that they are certainly willing to take big risks. Uh, This is a very different Cameco than the one that I used to invest in 20 years ago, uh, which I laughingly described as a merger between the Saskatchewan government and the Canadian government, which is to say basically a merger of two postal systems. Uh, We have a very, very, very different Cameco in place. Uh, whether they decide that the acquisition would be too dilutive from the point of view of existing shareholders uh, is a very open question. Mm. Yeah. But as you say, it's a very, very, very large bite. Uh, A a bite I suggest that Cameco and Fission by themselves uh, can't take. Mm. So I think uh, it will require uh, a third party, and I think it will require a gigantic third party uh, to build. And that would be a wonderful entry into the basin, particularly because I believe that the uh, political ability of China general nuclear to compete is very low. Hmm. Well, it's almost inexistent, right? Because Canada doesn't, I mean, I, I don't see them allowing it, especially, especially with something as sensitive as uranium. That would be my belief. They're of course, indirectly a very large shareholder in fission. Hmm. Uh, so we'll see. Uh, how that all plays out. Uh, And I might be surprised. Yeah, I've been surprised a few times, unfortunately. It's interesting, though, that some of the larger companies have um, been exiting the basis, like Rough Rider was sold last year, right? Which is an interesting move. I would have expected them to go the other way around, not sell, but buy more. 
Uh, I think what happened with regards to Rio is that Rough Rider uh, was never going to be a tier one deposit. Mm. Uh, it was a tier two deposit at best. And I don't see that Rio saw themselves achieving critical mass uh, in the east or southeast portion of the basin. Uh, Rio and BHP both, uh, and Barrick, I think, have renewed their commitment to not doing anything sub-tier one. Hmm. Uh, and, and Rough Rider was very unlikely to become a uh, 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 $10 billion in situ recoverable reserve deposit. Hmm. That's true. Um, what, what do you think is a sort of a reasonable timeline for your BHP, Rio Tech, or whoever, you know, the large diversified miners for them to start looking towards uranium? Is that sort of a one to three year type of thing, or is it a three to five year type of thing? I think it'll be opportunity centric. Uh, I Well, I know that Rio is looking now. Mm -hmm. Um you know, I know the Rio exploration guys, or some of them at least, fairly well. And I know that their mandate includes uh, even Greenfield's uranium exploration if the target size is large enough. BHP, of course, is a major player in uranium now with byproduct uranium sales from Olympic Dam. Uh, and this wouldn't be a far step. Both companies have said, as has Glencore publicly, that they are while not commodity ex uh, uh, agnostic, uh, willing to consider any opportunity which makes them a world-scale player in that commodity. Hmm. They, they have plenty of opportunities in, in Australia too. I mean, you mentioned your old pal Paladin, so that's reminding me of John Borshoff. He's gone silent since Uranium has uh, done, a, what, 100% almost. And so that's suggesting me he might be up to something. Um and as opposed to put this into a question, do you think that those large, your BHP and your Rios, do they go to the basin first or do they stay at home in Australia and look for opportunities there first? I don't think they stay at home uh, because the political climate with regards to uranium development in Australia needs to change. Hmm. There are still large elements, particularly of the Labour government in Australia, <clears throat> which are anti-nuclear. Uh, but I think you might see uh, BHP or Rio uh, become active in uranium in Africa. Hmm. Do you think there's something big enough to get their attention there? Not that it's been discovered yet, but we haven't looked very aggressively for a while. We are now. Uh, what people are doing in Namibia and Botswana, I think, is interesting. Hmm. I don't think that the opportunities in Niger uh, have been fully exploited. Now, Niger is a very, very, very tough place to operate right now because you know the government's in flux uh i think the success that paladin and now lotus have had in east africa is indicative of the fact that there's a lot of exploration potential uh in east africa and i myself am attracted by the uranium exploration potential uh in the democratic republic of congo drc uh, I'm not trying to say that that will emerge as a major uranium province, but I think that you could develop concept conceptual regional plays uh, in really any part of Africa with some focused exploration work mm. <clears throat> that could obtain funding from uh, either Rio or BHP. Mm. Well, if we think about less red tape and less probability for a coup, though, that sort of puts me in... Um... South America, we haven't seen a lot of, uh, you know, uranium development coming out of there, or, or much of exploration, really. Do you think that wakes up at some point? Uh, probably. Uh, there historically hasn't done been enough work that there's a lot of analogs. Uh, and I suspect that before you see South America, you'll see Central Asia. You'll see Kyrgyzstan, Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, mm -hmm. where there's a lot of Soviet era work and a lot of data. And uh, at least in Kazakhstan, uh, where there is an established, skilled, solvent uranium business. Hmm. And, and Uzbekistan is an interesting one. I see them at more and more conferences, uh, the government's taking out booths and talking about the potential investors. Have you any opportunity across your desk in Uzbekistan specifically? Yeah, we're involved in a couple of early stage private exploration ventures in Uzbekistan. With you know high quality Central Asian explorers and mercifully for me local partners, 
uh, I don't want to make inadvertent mistakes, something I've done a lot in my career. So I attempt where I can, if I'm going into a market I'm unfamiliar with, to uh, invest in a country where I have uh, major investors in the company that are locals. Hmm. That's it's, it's so private, early stage in Uzbekistan. It all sounds super scary to me, which means that it's probably a good opportunity. Uh, you know, it's, uh, this type of activity is both been both good and bad to me. Hmm. Uh, as I say, I, I was a very early mover in Afghanistan uh, hmm. and I lost 100% of the money I invested <laughs> mercifully quickly. Hmm. <laughs> uh, do you ever play something like political regime changes? And where I'm coming from with this is specifically Argentina, because I know you're a libertarian yourself and, and whatever's happening in Argentina is probably attracting your attention. But so, yeah, well, how do you look at that? I've invested in Argentina for years on a purely technical basis. And I don't mean technical like stock charting. I, I mean, geology and engineering. Mm -hmm. uh, probably the best known undeveloped oil and gas, unconventional oil and gas uh, exploration potential in the world is the Vaca Muerte uh, in Argentina, which attracts me. I, I can't resist world scale deposits. Uh, I have been an early and very patient investor with the Lundines throughout Argentina, initially with Argentina Gold, uh, a success, you know, sold to Barrick, uh, and much more recently with NGEX uh, and Philo. Um, I just, you know, I can't help myself. The, the idea that the geological potential of the Andes uh, ends at the Chilean border <laughs> and doesn't move across the, the Andes is silly. Uh, I believe that the political risk in Argentina in the near term at least is unchanged because although this guy is doing the right things and he is saying the right things, the country has no money. Uh, and I think that the Argentine voters have been schooled by 70 years of uh, peronista socialist idiocy to expect that the government exists to hand them subsidies. Uh, and I think that the vote against waste and fraud that you saw in Argentina was a vote by people against other people's waste and fraud. Uh, I think that the students will regard subsidized education as a right, not as a waste. I think that the people who are enjoying subsidized health care will regard that as a right, not as waste. I think that the Argentines are, are objecting to the benefits that other people get as waste. And I am afraid that the idea that the pain that will necessarily accomplish reversing 70 years of socialist idiocy will be too much in the near term for the people who are accustomed to that idiocy, the stomach. Hmm. And, and at the same time, it's still led by politicians and they still move their lips. So it's making me suspicious. I, I will say I'm going to vacation in Argentina uh, and I'm going to spend by my standards extravagantly, uh, both because I like Argentina and I have friends there, but also as a sort of a tacit way of supporting uh, the mm -hmm. decisions, uh, however temporary they may be, that the Argentines made. And of course, there's always a wonderful chance that I'm wrong, you know, uh, it may be a circumstance where the young voters who voted in mass uh, for the new administration mean what they say. Uh, this is a phenomenally rich, rich country. Uh, younger viewers, which I take it as most of your audience, should be reminded that the GDP per capita of Argentina in 1946 at the end of World War II exceeded the GDP per capita of Canada. Uh, I mean, it took real skill to ruin a country as rich as Argentina. Uh, mm. And there's always a chance, I suspect, uh, that the Argentines could decide to work their way out of failure, which would be a wonderful circumstance. Mm. Well, leave it to communists to ruin your country. I'm from Eastern Europe, so I would know, uh, unfortunately. It, it, I don't like you mentioning the Vicuña district because it reminds me of missing out on next gen, uh, on next gen, not next gen, NGX and um, 
and Philo, both of them. And uh, having seen them in around $200 million market caps, I'm thinking, oh, no, those are too expensive for explorers and not touching them. Do you think there's room for another Vicuña district? And, 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 and if there is, how do I recognize it? Uh, the answer to the first part of the question is yes. The answer to the second part of the question is you have to be willing to tolerate failure. You have to be willing to explore with high quality explorations in district scale exploration with good conceptual geology where the probability is that you lose your money. Hmm. Uh, for every success that I've enjoyed, like NGEX and Philo, uh, I've endured 10 failures. Uh, mercifully, the arithmetic around this is that if you have 10 failures where you lose 30% of your money, uh, you have one success where you get a 20 bagger, uh, that one success amortizes a hell of a lot of failures. <laughs> it's tough psychologically, but it's actually pretty good for the pocketbook. Mm. Uh, so I, you know, I just, I just regard these fairly frequent small failures as a price of the occasional big success. I don't, I don't like jumping through topics, but I know you only have a couple of more minutes here to go now. Uh, and there's two other places that I wanted to talk about. One of them was Mexico. Uh, recently, we had something coming out of there, Hercules uh, Silver, which is no longer a silver play, uh, that hit the stock really, really hard. Um, what, what do you make of uh, what do you make of Hercules' uh, downfall these last week? Well, partially, I think. Uh... It was buy on mystery, sell on history. I think that there were people who bought the stock in anticipation of a press release around follow on drilling. Uh, I thought the follow on drilling was fairly good and people sold the stock. Mm. Um, maybe I'm wrong. Um, yeah, you know, I mean, I'll leave it there. With regards to Mexico, I think the situation is deteriorating. The political situation is deteriorating. The mines minister was the ex environment minister, she's openly hostile to mining. Uh, the government is looking to steal money from wherever they can. Mines are fixed targets. And in addition to that, the sociological environment around the narcotraficantes uh, is deteriorating. Uh, Mexico, however, has a fantastic mineral endowment uh, and fantastic infrastructure, including human infrastructure around mining. So to the extent that I can be part of a big discovery in Mexico, I'll look at the politics, I'll look at the sociology, I'll hold my nose, and I'll buy. <laughs> hmm. Well, you said that you pay attention to the technical stuff, so geology and engineering and stuff like that. And, and, and what's rewarded investors over the last couple of years for Mexico is epithermal vein systems, specifically silver vein systems. Yes. Um, still an opportunity, or do you think that's gone? No, I, I absolutely still think it's an opportunity. You know, we're the old vein sets that you could stumble over, literally, that outcropped. <laughs> Uh, are probably pretty much discovered, except in places like Sinaloa, uh, where there is still active problems with narcotraficantes. You're going to have to go into places that you haven't been able to go in for the last 10 or 15 years. <laughs> and there, inevitably, when you go into those places, there are going to be problems. There are going to be geologists that are going to get murdered. That's what's going to have to happen. Um, the... The idea that Mag Silver had, that you merely stake the extension uh, of Fresnillo uh, across a bean field where you could see the yellow up alteration in the soil, uh, those opportunities are gone. <laughs> um, I mean, that was a brilliant piece of work, an absolutely brilliant piece of work. But I think the ability to duplicate that piece of work is gone. But when I look at the work that's being done by companies like Gogold, admittedly not a name, uh, that's an undiscovered name, but a name that's worn people out. Uh, I think there's still a lot of opportunity in Mexico, probably because it's in Mexico, uh, probably because the failures that people have experienced are fairly well documented. Hmm. For some reason, some of the people in the audience, when they want to look for that type of opportunities, um, they, they're always asking me to talk to you about some of the Arctic islands, which is, is too far of a concept for me to even get excited about. But do you think that those type of opportunities that existed in Mexico, let's say, 20, 30 years ago, now exist in places like Greenland? I, I think Greenland is a really interesting place to look geologically. Mm -hmm. uh, Mexico has this thing called infrastructure. <laughs> I mean, they have roads, they have power, they have cities, they have supermarkets, they have miners. They have a whole bunch of stuff that Greenland doesn't have. And Greenland needs to have a discussion with itself. Uh, 
they're schizophrenic with regards to mining. They want the investment, uh, but they seem to want the investors to discover something that can be mined with no surface disturbance uh, and shipped without generating carbon. So the sort of schizophrenic nature of Greenland's society with regards to mining is something that's going to need to be, need to be worked out. It's a, you know, in, in effect, it's a continuation of the Canadian Shield. It's a spectacular place to explore, as are the Canadian Arctic Islands. Mm -hmm. But notice that parenthetically, in the Canadian Arctic Islands, you're north of where Santa Claus is supposed to live. You know, you're uh, you're in a place that's very expensive to explore, uh, and heaven forbid you find something uh, very expensive to develop. It's hostile. It just doesn't want you to be there. <laughs> uh, Antonio, I need to drop off, but thank you so much for this. I'd like to remind your viewers that I can always be reached at Rural Investment Media. Uh, put your natural resource portfolio there. Let us list your natural resource portfolio, and I'll rank it myself, 1 to 10 on a no-obligations basis, 1 being best, 10 being worst. I also invite your audience to go to the Rural Classroom, where there's 200 hours of free programming around how to uh, analyze natural resource investments. And finally, uh, if you care, uh, on January 6th, I'm putting on something called the uh, Boot Camp, where we'll focus on how to invest in development stage companies. Hmm. So thanks for the opportunity to visit with your audience, uh, Antonio. Uh, until next time, sorry, but I've got to go. Thank you so much. Thanks, Rick. Um, I, I appreciate it. Enjoy your interview. Thank you.